So yes, the topic of my talk is path encoded high dimensional quantum states distribution towards QKD applications. So this is this was part of my uh, PhD project that I carried out at the Technical University of Denmark. And yes, so the outline of the talk is the following, a little bit about of motivations on why we wanna use high dimensional states and why path encoding is interesting. What are the issues like the stabilities, how, to, how we can uh, tackle them. Um, and then yes, so uh, preliminary feasibility results that shows that this actually works and how to move forward to a more uh, concrete uh, uh, setup that's more close to the actual applications. Okay, so let's start. So uh, as we all know, if we live in a two dimensional Hilbert space, then we, we can find two orthogonal states and to each of these, we can uh, associate one qubit, either uh, cat zero or cat one. If we wanna look at the classical correlation, like a classical correspondence, uh, then to each of these states, we, uh, we can see uh, a correspondence with a classical bit. If we then move to a d-dimensional Hilbert space, for instance, uh, then what we have is that we have the orthogonal uh, quantum states. Uh, so we can define what's called a QDIT, uh, uh, spanning from, for instance, cat zero to cat d minus one. And to this, to each of these states, uh, the classical correspondence is then a classical bit string of length log two of d. So this is actually the first a <clears throat> big improvement that we can get uh, going high dimensional, uh, the larger information capacity. And then it turns, as it turns out, uh, we also have enhanced noise resilience, which means for instance, if we use uh, this kind of states for QKD application, uh, the eavesdropper actually introduces more error in our channel, which means it's easier to detect him. Uh, okay, so uh, there are many ways, uh, like many degrees of freedom that we can use to encode this kind of states. And one very promising degree of freedom is path encoding. And this is because it's like the main degree of freedom used in photonic integrated circuits. Uh, so this is how maybe schematically it works. We can imagine that we have several spatial modes and our photon is living in either one of those. And this is how we can construct a, a computational basis. And then our general state will be described by something like this, where uh, we have a general superposition on, on these modes. Um, then uh, the question is, this is super nice if we want to stay on our uh, photonic integrated circuit, but what if we want to just communicate? We want to use these states to do a quantum communication protocol. Um, one way we can think about transporting these states is to couple each one of these modes to a different single mode fiber, which is shown here on the, on the left. Um, or we could also try to exploit this uh, different kind of fiber, which is called multicore fiber, shown here on the right, uh, where basically on the same cladding area, uh, we have several different cores. Uh, so we could think of coupling each one of these modes to a different core in our multicore fiber. Uh, the main uh, uh, reason why it's interesting to use multicore fiber is because uh, uh, of how the phase relations are maintained throughout transmission. So here we, I basically plot uh, the interference output of a two kilometer long uh, uh, interferometer where the two arms were uh, single mode fibers uh, in purple. And as you can see, uh, for instance here, we go from a um, constructive interference to destructive interference in a, in a very short time scale. However, if we do the same, but using two cores of the same multicore fiber as the two arms of our interferometer, uh, the results are plotted here in orange and red. Um, as you can see, we still have phase drift, but they're much, much slower. So this really, really tells us that uh, it's, a, it's a good platform to use for the transportation of this kind of states. Uh, so as I said, uh, it's better than single mode fibers, but we still have phase drift. So we still need to stabilize them if we want to have high fidelity transmission. Um, 
one way of doing it is just uh, schematically depicted here. So we imagine that we have our fiber-based interferometer, where in our case, the two arms are these two cores of the same multicore fiber. We shine line into, uh, light into it, and then we basically uh, monitor one of the two outputs. Uh, this is then like a signal that's fed to an electronic phase lock loop board, which use this uh, signal to keep track of the phase drifts happening here. Uh, and then generate a second signal that's used to compensate for these drifts uh, by acting basically on a, on a phase actuator, like a phase shifter inside of the interference. Okay, so the multicore fiber that we had uh, available in our lab was a seven core multicore fiber, two kilometer long. Uh, it has a very different uh, loss per core ranging from 2.7 dB to 10. Uh, this is actually very high, but it's not due to the fiber itself, but mostly to the fan-in and fan-out coupling devices to it. Another important uh, thing for quantum communication is also the, the crosstalk between the cores, so how much light is coupled from one core to the other. And this has to be as low as possible, and we measured it to be always, for each couple of cores, uh, less than minus 46 dBs. Okay, so if we can think of uh, one... Uh, application. Uh, what I think of is uh, a QKD protocol where we have two mutually unbiased spaces. So if we want to show uh, uh, this high dimensional uh, path encoded uh, QKD protocol, then what we need to do is to de uh, design a peak to mutually unbiased spaces that live on a, for instance, four dimensional Hilbert space. What we did was to choose two smart bases. Uh, uh, in the sense that all the states here are always a superposition on, of only two cores. Uh, other, uh, like the more uh, conventional basis choice would be to have one uh, core per uh, state in one basis and the superposition over four cores on the other one. Uh, instead, in this way, it allows us to uh, basically stabilize one interference at a time. Uh, so. Uh, after choosing this this uh, set of bases, what we have is we designed a preliminary setup. Uh, yes, I don't have much time to go through this, but maybe the most important part is that we have one uh, uh, light source, one laser, which is then split into two paths. Uh, the first one, following the red arrows, is going to be our quantum signal, where we carve these uh, weak coherent pulses, and then we prepare a superposition over two cores, and then we uh, at Bob's side, uh, we project into um, uh, one of the all the possible states of one basis. The other path, the blue one, is sent uh, to the receiver side and will then be uh, uh, pro counter propagated, so from right to left, uh, following exactly the same uh, fiber path interferometer as the quantum signal. And then it will be detected at any side uh, where we use the phase lock loop board to stabilize the interference. OK, uh, if we use this setup, we can then send only one state at a time. So we did that. We chose one state. We projected onto all the state of its phases. And we measured the fidelity for all of them. And in average, we can see that we have very high fidelity. And this tells us that we're actually uh, able to stabilize our interference. Uh, these are measurement taking uh, taken over five minutes. Uh, on a much longer time scale, we want to show also the stability. Uh, so we have here a plot that shows the stability over seven hours and uh, of the what we call quantum bit rate. So again, we choose one state. We prepare always that one, and we project on all of the others, and then we count how many uh, uh, errors. Uh, so projection on the wrong states we have over all the number of the of the clicks that we detect, and this is plotted here. So we have something maybe started from two point five percent and going up to maybe something around five percent, uh, with a slow increases in time, and this is probably due to temperature changes and polarization drift. While these abrupt uh, lines here uh, are due to loss of the locking position uh, by the by the phase lock loop board uh, but as as you can see like the previous uh, performance was very very uh, neatly recovered in a very short time okay
okay then uh if we want to then move towards something that's more uh, close to a an actual setup that can be used to implement a QKD protocol, what we need to do is actually implement real-time state choice. And this requires fast phase modulation. And by fast, I mean as fast as the um, repetition rate of our system, which is uh, 600 megahertz in this case. Um, this fast uh, phase modulation need to stay inside our interferometer, basically, uh, in order to be able to uh, uh, have the correct phase shift between the modes. And uh, as I said before, the stabilization signal needs to go through the exact same fiber optical path as the quantum signal. And this basically means that if we just put a phase modulator over there, then we will also modulate the phase of our uh, stabilization signal uh, which is uh, going to end up in us not being able to see uh, any uh, information uh, that's, that's really valuable anymore because of this very, very high bandwidth of this phase modulation. And this is shown here. So basically, we are inducing fringes on our stabilization signal, uh, but we can't see them in the first one second uh, because the phase modulator was on and was imposing the, the modulation also on the on the stabilization signal. As to, and then as soon as we turn it off, so more or less here, uh, then we start to see the fringes again. So one way to go around this problem was to, that we found out, was to actually exploit the polarization dependence of the phase modulators. And these, um, uh, we are using lithium niobate phase modulators. So they're basically uh, modulate on one, uh, they have a, a preference axis the, where the, the modulation is actually effective. And so what we designed was uh, this kind of loop to help us maintain two orthogonal polarization. So we pick uh, the polarization that's actually modulated for the quantum signal and the polarization that's not modulated for the, for the stabilization signal. And this allows us to actually be able to see the fringes that we are inducing on the on the stabilization signal all of the time, even if, when the phase modulator is on. So then we can design an experimental setup that's uh, a little bit more uh, complex than before. The main difference is that we have two different lasers now, uh, for one for the quantum signal, one for the stabilization signal, and um, a two different wavelength so that we are able to, uh, at receiver side, we are able to uh, distinct between them by using a wavelet division multiplexing filter. They're both co-propagating in this scheme and well the quantum signal can choose between all of the states on one basis. Uh, we have a switch uh, that chooses the pairs of cores, the beam splitter prepared the superposition and this phase modulation loop that I showed in the previous slide uh, actually modulate the phase of the signal. Uh, Another thing to notice is that here we need two phase lock loop ports uh, because we basically have two interferometer uh, working at the same time. So finally, results. Uh, here we show we plot the quantum meter rate while uh, uh, preparing states in one basis and projecting into the, the same basis. And as you can see, again, uh, this is pretty flat apart from these abrupt changes when at least one of the board unlocked. Uh, after 40 minutes, again, we have a slight increase, probably due to temperature or polarization. And the, the average value is slightly higher than before. Uh, but this is because we have two contribution now to the error. We have the error for the phase, uh, so the modulation and the stability, uh, which is shown in orange in the inset. But then we also have uh, another contribution from the, given from the switch, which is uh, shown in blue and, of course, does not change uh, depending on the phase drift. So if we look at the only the phase error contribution, we can see that it's very, very similar to the results we had in the, the feasibility study. If we compare our results to state of the art, we can see that in previous results, they tried to stabilize much shorter multiple fibers, achieving higher uh, quantum meter rates. Uh, and then uh, this paper is actually very interesting the, that was published when we were <laughs> almost finished measuring our results. They have a longer multiple fiber, similar results as ours, uh, but still the modulation rate is much slower.
Uh, okay, so if we want to use our setup to uh, go towards a QKD implementation, then we can think about implementing a VB84 uh, four dimensional uh, protocol. So we, with coherent pulses with one decoy state. And then what, it, what that means is that we need to measure uh, the QBR in four different uh, uh, configurations. If we do that, uh, more or less we get as an average 4.5% which leads uh, to an overall secret key generation of 6.3 uh, megabit per second, which means that we actually achieve similar uh, performance as other more common degrees of freedom in QKD, like time bin encoding. Uh, what we also did was to emulate longer channel by just adding more losses to our fiber, and the results are all shown here. So to summarize, uh, yes, so path encoded high dimension QDs are promising, and uh, because of photonic integrated circuits, we can use them for quantum communication if we, for instance, use multicore fiber for transmission, and we can stabilize the remaining phase drift. Uh, one way to uh, uh, have fast phase modulation is uh, that we thought of was to actually exploit this polarization dependence of the phase modulators, and this led us to a final setup that shows long-term stability low quantum bit rate and high secret key generation rate. Finally, what we would like to do in the future is to validate our, our system with longer multicore fibers and maybe be able to design and implement a real-time business choice setup. So with this, I would like to thank you and acknowledge all the people that made uh, uh, these results uh, possible.